with the NFL draft just over two weeks away, more mocks are coming out from the, the big names. And Brock Bowers' name just keeps on coming up for the Jets at 10. We're going to talk about that and some options at quarterback on day three and beyond. Maybe even UDFA types. I'm Glenn Norton with Jet Nation Radio and JetNation.com. Be sure to log into JetNation.com where you can register and become a part of what is the most active Jets message board on the web. Just me tonight. Tomorrow, it's going to be myself, Dylan Terman, Chris Schubert. For tomorrow's show, we're going to do our My Guy episode, which is always a good time. It's fun to kind of put your name out there or, or put, put, put a list out there of the names of players that maybe you feel aren't being talked about enough. Maybe you like more than most people do, um, kind of planting your flag. Uh, it's become a big thing on Twitter, you know, people over the, the in the weeks leading up to the draft. Get, name your guy. Tell us your guy. So we're going to do that tomorrow. Um, I, for me personally, I try to avoid the, the top 20, 30, 40 guys, like the, the easy shoe wins. Like, of course, Marvin Harrison. Yeah, that's my guy. Um, but, you know, how much how much thought did you have to put into that? Um, you watch the guy for about three seconds and you know right away that he's, you know, the guy's got a Hall of Fame ceiling. So we'll have we'll have that tomorrow. My guy and, and some more stuff. We'll have some mock stuff. Wild Wave, how are we doing, man? Glad to see you here as always. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Mel Kuyper's latest mock and Eric Galco. Eric Galco is a guy, if you're not familiar with him, you really should be. Um, in the draft community, in the player development, talent evaluation community, he's one of the more prominent guys out there, but uh, his name doesn't get mentioned nearly enough, at least in my opinion. Excuse me. Um, his name, that Eric Galco, doesn't get mentioned nearly enough. Um, he was the director of player personnel for the XFL. Um, and then when the, when the XFL went under, he was brought on to be the, the developer develop, uh, of player personnel for the Shrine Bowl. So Eric Galco, before that, we had him on our show several times. He was a sporting news guy. Um, so he's been in that space and doing that job for a long time. And he nailed some predictions. Um, so much so that it, I'm surprised he doesn't get talked about more. Always been a big fan of his work. Um, and he had one pick in his mock that blew me away. Um, a player who I love and a player who I thought, man, can the Jets, if the Jets add a second. And and again, it's a guy like the Jets don't need this year. But if they were to get him in the third round, I would love it. Um, Eric Galco had him going in the first round. We'll talk about that a little bit too. But starting with Bauer. So I've noticed in recent days, weeks, whatever, however short of a time frame, Bowers to the Jets at 10, it's become a chalk pick now. It, it's it's by far the most prominent pick. Brock Bowers to the Jets. I've been saying it for weeks. I did a uh an appearance last night on Fox uh Lehigh Valley, Fox Sports Radio, picking for the Jets for their mock. Let me got a Kentucky game on here to watch a little bit of Devin Leary. Get that to stop flashing. Um I took Bowers, no surprise there, even though I still think a trade down wouldn't be a bad idea, uh, you know, if they can. You know, perfect world is trade down to 14, 15, 16 even, um, scoop up a pick and and get Bowers there. Um, but we'll see. But Mel Kuyper puts out his most recent – we'll go over Eric Galco's first because Eric Galco, his mock came out a couple of days ago, and uh, we'll go over, you know, a lot of stuff – not a ton of surprises. Caleb Williams won. Jalen Jaden Daniels two to, to the uh, Commanders. Vikings trading up, swapping with the Pats to come up to three and take Drake May. I think Drake May. That guy's gonna be awesome. Um, I feel the same about Daniels and, and Williams. I think all three of these guys are gonna be good. But Drake May, he's so young. I, if I'm not mistaken, he's 20, and and his ability to go through progressions and and read a defense, uh, you know, jumped out to me two years ago. As a freshman, I watched that guy, and I was like, this dude is light years ahead of where he should be for, you know, being a 19-year-old kid in his first year of, you know, major college football. Um, and he was something else. Jaden Daniels, obviously, and, and Caleb Williams, both com completely different skill sets. You can't go wrong with any of them. I mean, with the right coaching, all three of those guys are going to be really good. He's got J.J. McCarthy going fourth to the, the Broncos trading up to take McCarthy fourth. Listen, McCarthy, people talk about his production, but listen, he went to a college where he wanted to win. That was his priority. Even though Michigan didn't ask him to throw the ball 40, 50 times a game, 
which is what a lot of these college QBs want because they want to showcase their skills. McCarthy just wanted to win. If you put his pass attempt numbers, you know, extrapolate, sort of put them on the level of, of a, a, a Caleb Williams or a Drake May, McCarthy's numbers like TDs per game, you know, uh, INT rate, his numbers would be pretty damn good too. Uh, the thing is, it feels like he's a late riser. Nobody was really talking about him going this early. Um, and if he does, he does. But that would be that'd be really, uh, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, you know, especially at four, I thought maybe a team trades up with the Jets to 10 or at 10 and tries to grab him. But um, we'll see where he goes. Joe Alt goes fifth to the Chargers. And this is Eric Galco's mock. And then the Giants snag Marvin Harrison Jr. My goodness, that would be, I mean, if you're a Giants fan, you'd be doing backflips in that situation. Then you've got the Cardinals going with Malik Neighbors. Uh, they traded with the Titans in this mock, it looks like. Dallas Turner, eight to the Falcons. Roma Dunze, nine to the Bears. That's a hell of a tandem. Williams and Odunze, you know, to 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 start their careers together in Chicago would be uh that, that they could rewrite the record books in Chicago. And then, of course, 10th, Brock Bowers. And the rationale here for Galco, and I'll, I'll read what he says. He says, the Jets have the Jets only have four O-linemen under contract for 2025, and either picking an O-lineman here or trading back and grabbing one and a few more picks may be their best option. I don't disagree with that. But the chance to add Brock Bowers in what should be a win-now season Feels too exciting to pass up for Aaron for an Aaron Rodgers led offense. This is the point I've made 50 million times over. Some people, um, I don't know if they just don't want to hear it, if they don't agree with it. This is about the fact that this team is trying to win now. They have to win now, or they're all getting fired. So if you have to win now, you draft guys who are going to play now. I understand the injury risk with with uh, the tackles and with with AVT like. There are guys who are going to miss games. That's why the Jets need to add some depth. They've 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 got some. Carter Warren's got a year under his belt. I'm not completely convinced that the Jets' plan isn't to add one of these veteran tackles who are sitting out there in free agency now, add one of these guys immediately after the draft. No longer part of the comp picks in a uh, formula, and it gives you you know you can add a guy who's played for some really good teams. Um, and there's, you know, we, we've talked about it several times. There's three or four guys out there. Um, Cam Fleming is a guy that I keep mentioning, uh, you know, back to you, Ari, if you, if you can get him to come in for super cheap with, with an eye on only playing a handful of games, I could live with, I hate it. I hated the idea of back when people were talking about him as a starter, sign him. No, you don't sign back to start. However, I could live with not, not would love, but I could live with saying we're going to bring him in to play the few games that Smith can't. And if they both get hurt, then Carter Warren's playing a few games before, you know, uh, while either one or both of those guys recover. Um, and again, there's there's Cam Fleming's another option. But the, the point being, I'm not saying you draft Brock Bowers and that's that. You're going to battle with, with Smith and Warren as your tackles. No, you draft Brock Bowers, you take a tackle, you add a tackle through free agency, and you've got Carter Warren behind that guy. Um, and possibly draft the guy. Somebody like Roger Rosengarten falls. I mean, listen, people seem to be all over the map on where he's going to go. Some people think he's a, a round three guy. Some people think he's a round two guy. If he's there in round three with the Jets pick, you take Rosengarten. There you go. And, and I think that might be why, at least I'm hoping, because the Jets have to recognize the fact that they've still got to add depth to tackle. So my hope is they're looking at this and saying, well, let's see how the draft goes. If something like that were to happen, if if we if we're on the clock in the third round and Rosengarten's still there and we take him, then maybe we're not going to add a free agent tackle. It's a little bit risky. I would still prefer a veteran, but uh, we'll know in the sort of three four days after the draft what the plan is. But this is the point Galco makes. This is the point I've been making for some time now. Is that in getting Bowers and going after Bowers, you're doing it because it's a win now team and you've got to produce this year. Again, I get that guys may start, you know, guys may get some starts if you take a rookie there. But as I've said many times, what if he starts four games? What if you take Olu Fashanu or whoever in that spot and Tyron Smith gets injured, misses five games, Fashanu fills in for five games? Is that worth pick 10? 
a guy who plays five games? I would argue no. Um, and again, but Glenn, the future, right? I get that. Whoever they take, whether it's Bowers or a tackle or a receiver, whoever they take is also going to be part of the future. So it, when, when I say Brock Bowers and people say, yeah, but the future, yeah, but I, Brock Bowers, he can be part of that too. So that was that's the top 10 from Eric Galco. The, the pick I wanted to mention, he's got Fashanu going 11. I'll go through these real quick. Olu Fashanu going 11 to the Pats. J.C. Latham going 12 to the Titans. 13th pick is Amarius Mims. Three tackles in a row there. And make it four. Troy Fatanu to the Saints. Brian Thomas Jr. to the Bills. That would be a nice fill-in, having lost uh, Stephon Diggs. D.T. Byron Murphy, Texas defensive tackle, going to the Seahawks at 16. 17, he's got Kenyon Mitchell going to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Halise Fuaga, 18 to the Bengals. Cooper DeGene, 19 to the, to the uh, L.A. Rams. Pick 20, Terry and Arnold, corner out of Alabama. 21, this is a no-brainer pick for the Miami Dolphins and will be an absolute steal. Johnny Newton. Kool-Aid McKinstry, 22 to the Eagles, makes a ton of sense. Jared Verse, 23 to the Pats. Not great news for the Jets, but listen, they're, they're good players. Everyone. Everyone's going to have a chance to get a good player. Uh, Graham Barton. Now, Graham Barton is a guy, if the Jets were to move down and not take Bowers and land at 18, 19, somewhere in that range, and Bowers is off the board, I would take Graham Barton. Absolutely. I think he can play at a very high level at multiple positions. Um, and if you've added that second, then, or, you know, whatever. I mean, I would think if you're going from 10 to 24, you're hoping to add, add a second, or not necessarily 24, but if you move down far enough that you recoup a second-round pick, I would have no problem with an offensive lineman in that spot because you can grab a receiver or somebody. And and, and Barton, by the way, those, oh, but Glenn, you said it's got to be a starter. I think Barton is good enough to win a starting job. I think he could beat out John Simpson. Same with Jackson Powers Johnson. You bring Barton, Jackson Powers Johnson, one of those guys could beat out John Simpson and take that job. Uh, Patriots have a whole rebuild in front of them. They certainly do. The Pats are a, a, a little ways away. Um. And we don't need, listen, brand new head coach. We don't we don't know if he's any good. We don't know if he's gonna we don't know if he's gonna be a guy who needs three or four years to figure it out as a head coach. We don't know if he's a guy who's gonna figure it out in year one. We don't know if he's a guy who's never gonna figure it out. You don't know these things until we watch them play out. Um Edgerin Cooper, 25 to the Packers, Nate Wiggins, the corner from Clemson, 26 to the Tampa Bay Bucks, Ruka Rororo going 27 to the Cardinals. Bernardo Green goes to the Bills at 28. Yes, 28. That's the uh, FSU linebacker. Tyler Newbin, Minnesota safety. He did not have a great pro day, but he is a he's a bright guy, makes plays on the ball, always knows where to be. He and funny enough that he has him going to uh, Detroit, where they got Branch last year, who was a guy who didn't have a great pro day, but because he plays with good anticipation, he, he understands what's going on in front of him. He makes plays, and Newman could join him in that secondary as a couple of guys who are really good and uh, just fall because of bad pro days and end up being really good players. Um, and here's the guy, Mike Sanistro. Um, Eric Galco's got him going 30th. I love this guy. I've I've been a big fan of his a couple of years now. Um, and it, when you have a guy who's played corner as well as he has, despite being converted from wide receiver, the learning curve was like, it was like that. He, he almost immediately, he looked comfortable at corner, saw him making plays. Go back to the Ohio State game last year, made a great play preventing a touchdown on the corner of the end zone, um, batted the ball out of the receiver's hands. Just Mike Sanders drill, very athletic, can play the slot, can probably play outside. This is the highest I've seen him projected. Uh, like I said, I was hoping if the Jets scooped up a second or really, given that there, it's not a need there this year, I probably was realistically or more willing if it was in the third round where – you can live with doing something like that. But these first and second round picks have to start. Um, but Santa's drill, it's more of a personal. He's one of my favorites, one of my guys, as, as I was saying a minute ago. So he goes to the Ravens at 30 and Eric Galco's mock. Xavier Worthy, wide receiver for the Texas Longhorns, who ran the fastest 40 in combine history at 4-2-1. The Panthers trade up and grab him at 31. And then at 32, A.D. Mitchell, another Texas wide receiver. Texas wide receiver teammates go 31 and 32 to close out the first round in Eric Galco's first mock. 
Um, and then we go to the Kuiper one. We'll just we'll do the top ten for Kuiper. So he's got Caleb Williams at one. He's got Jaden Daniels at two. He's got Drake May at three. But this time Drake May going to the Pats, not a trade up. Marvin Harrison four. All of this feels very very chalk, as we like to say nowadays. McCarthy at five to the Vikings with a trade up. That's something you could see coming. Giants Malik Neighbors seems like a no brainer. Joe Alt seven to the uh, Titans makes sense. Dallas Turner to the Falcons makes sense. Although having brought in Kirk Cousins, I wonder if they're going to say, you know what, let's just load up. They have a bunch of young, talented offensive players. They might say, let's grab another one. Let's just be unstoppable on offense. And if they add a guy like Roma Dunze and pair him with London, they, yeah, they, they could be special. And speaking of Roma Dunze, again, he goes at number nine to the Chicago Bears. And once again, number 10, Brock Bowers. And here's what Kuiper says about Bowers to the Jets. This is really the first logical match I see for Bowers, the two-time Mackey Award winner, who is head and shoulders above the other tight ends in this class. And as Kuiper and myself and many others have pointed out, more than just a tight end, if the Jets are all in around quarterback Aaron Rodgers this season, taking Bowers would give them the best chance to make a playoff run. They brought in left tackle Tyron Smith and right tackle Morgan Moses last month, which lessens, I would say reduces, which lessens the word, which lessens the need for an immediate starter at tackle. This just makes sense. Um, again, Kuiper hammers home the point of this being a win now season. Um, I don't think you draft backups in win now seasons. That's and it seems that some folks are on board with that. One other one I wanted to mention. Former Minnesota Vikings general manager Rick Spielman, who now covers the draft for CBS Sports. Highly recommend it with the first pick draft, uh, with the first pick podcast, him and Ryan Wilson. Spielman didn't do a mock, but he ranked the top five tight ends. And I'm actually going to talk about two of them. Uh, but number one is Brock Bowers. And he basically says, so here, here, here's the big piece. Um, cause they, they love doing comps on their shows. And so I was curious to see what Rick Spielman's comp was for Brock Bowers combination of Kansas city tight end, Travis Kelsey and 49ers tight end, George Kittle. I mean, you don't want that. You'd rather have a backup tackle this in a win now year to each his own. Uh, yes, Bowers is the consensus top tight end prospect. No, I don't question his toughness after returning to Georgia for the Auburn game after having tightrope surgery on his ankle. Bowers is a special prospect. He is the only for sure first round tight end. Highest he can see him getting drafted, 10th. Lowest he can see him getting drafted, 20th. Best team fit. Bowers' first potential landing spot at 10th overall with the Jets. Final thoughts on Bowers to the Jets from Spielman. Bowers is one of the best tight end prospects in years, and his abilities as a pass catcher are such that it wouldn't be crazy for him to officially change positions to become a wide receiver in the NFL. No tight end has more catches, receiving yards, or receiving touchdowns than Bowers during his collegiate career from 2021 to 2023. There were games in which he single-handedly carried the Bulldogs to victory like he did in their game at Auburn, when he, went, when he went off for 157 yards and a touchdown on eight catches. Bowers' ability to feast with the ball in his hands after the catch is phenomenal. It's so good he could take an end-around. He can take end-around handoffs for 75-yard rushing touchdowns. Now, I know what he's talking about there. That was against Kent State. Um, in fact, he, he links the play down here. Bowers is the only player in college football to accumulate 25 or more receiving touchdowns and five or more rushing touchdowns in a career since West Virginia All-American Tavon Austin did it. Far different player. Tavon Austin weighed about 85 pounds. Um, that's elite explosive company, especially for a tight end. He can be the hub of a team's passing game like Travis Kelsey. I mean, the other guy, actually, I did want to touch on this. Um, his number two, because I tweeted the other day that if you don't get a Brock Bowers and you would like a player like that, you're not getting another player. There's not another Brock Bowers in this draft or maybe on the planet. Um. But Brock Bowers light, if you're looking for that, Rick Spielman's number two tight end in this draft class, Kansas State's Ben Simmons, 6'4", 250. 
And he says his his comp is Tyler Croft, not great, or a poor man, Sam Laporta. That's looking at the year Laporta had last year. That's pretty damn good. Spielman says about Senate, this kid has a huge chip on his shoulder. He was a walk-on at K-State and overcame that. When you talk to him, when you watch him play, he's always out to prove people wrong. I think he'll continue to do that in the NFL with everybody that has doubts on this kid. Multiple position player, H-back, fullback, tight end. Really like him as a real as a really good player. Tested well at the combine, ran in the four sixes, four six eight, forty inch vert. All the athletic test numbers. I think people backed by how explosive he was in some of those test numbers. I think he's going to come out and carve out a role right away. I think he's a little underrated right now, and he could be a surprise contributor next year for whoever selects him. Highest he can get drafted, early second round, lowest end of the second round, best fit the Giants. So that's Ben Sennett, a guy again who. Spielman has as his number two tight end. But people have said to me a million times, um, let's see, Bowers doesn't fit our scheme, though. So how is he a fit? Bowers is – the Jets are – I would imagine, I would expect, would use him a lot like Georgia did and put him in the slot and hit him with quick hitters. And that's – and we've talked about – listen, part of the allure, part of the reason – that you wanted Aaron Rodgers, not just because of the obvious, you know, the fact that he's so great. Um, you look at his career, you look at the way he played in Green Bay. Rodgers did a phenomenal job of hitting guys early on in their route or it with quick hit early on in the play with guys running routes where they create create quick separation. And this is what Bowers does well. I mean, Bowers does a lot of things well, but that's one of them. Um, even screens. Rodgers throws a ton of screens, and that's exactly how Georgia used him. You could you you could have him continue doing the same thing here that he did there that he's proven he can do. Obviously, he's not proven at the pro level, but nobody in this class has proven they can do anything at the pro level. So Bowers, you bring Bowers in and you continue using him in that role. You're you're and this is why last year, I've talked about this before. I mentioned it the other day. This is why last season I was a big advocate of going out and drafting Jackson Smith and Jigma. And because Rodgers got hurt and the season was over three minutes in, nobody cares. Everybody forgot. Not a big deal. Um, but you look at what Jackson Smith and Jigba did last year as a rookie. And again, his, his ability to get open off the line with his agility, his, his quick lateral movement. I think he him with Rodgers would have been a really nice pairing. Jets obviously dropped the ball there. So here we are one year later. Now you have an opportunity again to get a guy who you can line up in the slot, who can get open in a hurry. And I'm not, again, screens, obviously, but you can have him run short stuff. He can win up the seam. I'm, I'm not saying he can only, you know, win underneath. He can absolutely do that, but he can win down the field. You put Bowers in this offense, and you you just have him do what Rodgers has done in the past. Because people say, oh, but Glenn, Aaron Rodgers has never used his tight ends. When has Aaron Rodgers had a tight end? Drawing comparisons to Travis Kelsey and George Kittle. Like, if and, you know... I've said this before, and I, others have said it. If the Jets take Brock Bowers, they're not doing that without having Aaron Rodgers watch a little film on Brock Bowers and saying, hey, man, Aaron, what do you think of this guy? And Aaron Rodgers saying, yeah, that we can make that work. That guy can play. Any any pass catcher they do, especially if they're drafting a pass catcher early on, I guarantee you they're not drafting one without Aaron Rodgers watching him and saying, yeah, let's get that guy. So I'm not saying he'll be making the pick, but I would imagine the Jets will have probably five or six guys that they're willing to take early on. And they'll say, Hey man, which guy do you prefer the most? Who who do you see being able to be successful with? And so there will be input as there should be with any future hall of fame quarterback for a team that's in search of another quality target. If you're going to draft one, there's no reason why you shouldn't have that quarterback take a look. So the praise doesn't get much higher than that. folks. And you, listen, I, whatever people don't like someone's opinion, they go, oh, Rick Spielman, what did he win? He got fired. Blah, blah, blah. The guy was 30, 30 years as an executive, 11 years as a GM. He's 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 got some idea what he's doing. Um, again, his brother obviously played for the Lions, Vikings for a very long time. But that's, I, I've said, you know, when the, when the Bowers conversation started a couple of months ago, I was saying this guy can be, is good enough within three to five years. He'll contribute right away. In three to five years, he could be tight end one in the NFL. And the number of people I've heard say, you don't take a tight end to 10 unless he's unless he's Jason Kelsey. 
All right. Well, an 11-year GM just looked at him and said, this guy's pro comp is Kelsey and a little bit of Kittle. Like, either one of those guys would be an awesome comp. Uh, both of them, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to come off this, this idea that he's, he's the guy. Um, I still, but listen, do we have to accept the fact that the Jets may trade down and, and, and Bowers will be gone before they're on the clock again? Certainly. Um, and then in that spot, you take a receiver. Absolutely. Um, you take a tackle if you've added a second rounder and, you know, you can take the tackle early and it's not as big of it. Like that's part of this too is that it's not as if the Jets have two picks in the top 50. They've got one pick in the top 70. You take a you take a backup at 10, and then you wait 60 more picks to take a guy? Not a great way to show the fans, to show the owner that you're trying to win now, and that's got to be the objective. So to me at this point, it's become so – and listen, you know, it could be my bias because I've wanted Bowers forever. Um, but I think now you're seeing Kuiper, you're seeing – uh, you know, Eric Galco, you're seeing Rick Spielman, like you're seeing analysts, former GMs, personnel people. And listen, I went on, you know, I looked up the other day, I forget the name of the site. Um, there's a site that, that, that pulls together all the mock drafts and tells you, you know, where, where players are being mocked. You type in a player name and it gives you like months worth of mock drafts and where they're going. And I looked up Brock Bowers the other day and a lot of them look, a lot of them are like not named people, not, not not people who are known well within the industry. Uh, it's not to say it can't be right, but no one's going to take you serious. If you, listen, if someone says Glenn Norton from Jet Nation said this guy, go, people are going to say, who cares? What did Mel Kuyper say? What did what did Daniel Jeremiah say? What did Eric Galco say? Um, by the way, Daniel Jeremiah has the Jets going with Fuaga, uh, but he also has Joe All. Sorry, not Joe All. He also has Brock Bowers as his number seven player in this draft on this top 50. I believe he was six in the last one and seven this one. So you're still talking top 10 player. Um top five, four non-quarterback, which is <clears throat> excuse me, which is kind of where I've had him all along. I've kind of said you got you got the QBs. They're sort of a different category altogether. Talking about all other players, Marvin Harrison one, Brock Bowers two for me. Marvin Harrison is going to be gone. So that leaves Bowers as the best player in this draft who is not a quarterback and really could end up being better than some of the quarterbacks, but even still um, to knock the pick, I still see people calling him a tight end. I still see people. Oh, we can't, we already have Conklin. Yeah, I get that. And I hate beating a dead horse, but they can play together. Bowers is a slot guy. Bowers played the slot more than he played tight end in college. He could very well do that in the pros and line up at tight end and line up. at He can be all over the place. So the, the, the thought that, Oh my God, why would we take Bowers when we have Conklin? Because you can play Bowers, Conklin, and Garrett Wilson at the same time. You know, Mike, everyone's worried about the tackles. No one's worried about the Mike Williams injury history. That he might get hurt and miss some time, and you might need another credible receiver there. Anyone think of that? Charles T. Ayer says if Bowers is there at 10, you have to take him. Odunze is a tough choice, but he would have to take Odun. But would have to take Odunze. He said, you have to take Ozunze, and then you said, you have to take, I'm not sure what you meant there. Um, and yes, Charles, Bowers will be a better player than Conklin, no doubt. But that doesn't mean Conklin's not good, and that doesn't mean you couldn't put them both on the field at the same time and create nightmare matchups for the opposing defenses. This is my 16th all-in year with the Jets. It never works. Well, Tony, you're not wrong. Um, I don't disagree. I, I often say, you know, this team will find ways to screw it up. I said a few days before the opener last year, I was talking to someone on the phone about this, this team and how excited we were about the season. And I just kind of said, here's a thought. What if this all blows up and falls apart? And the person was like, don't even speak that into existence. I'm like, look, I'm a Jets fan. I have to accept that no matter what they do, I, part of me is going to expect failure. Uh, but the alternative, Tony, is just not talk about them. Or not root like we're gonna root for them, and if we're gonna root for them, we're gonna talk about them. I mean, we're we're football addicts, we're football junkies. There's no getting around that. And when I see people say, you know, I went to the forums on Jet Nation the other day, and Brian Baldinger ranked the the top five, top ten teams in the AFC, and he ranked the Jets third over, not AFC East, third best team in the AFC per Brian Baldinger. 
I thought, oh, that's there's an interesting topic to talk about. And the number of people. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about it. I, I get where they're coming from. Tired of losing. Let's see the results. But it's the offseason. All we can do is either talk about the team or not talk about the team. And if you don't want to talk about the team, that's fine. And if you're going to talk about them, the only thing you can really talk about is your expectations. I think that based on what they've done, they might be able to do this. I mean, listen, if this team stays healthy, this team is 1 million percent a Super Bowl contender. I don't I don't I don't care if anyone laughs or disagrees like show me where this team has such a weakness with the starting 22 that they're not a Super Bowl contender. They 100% are. However, we all know there will be injuries. No matter what team you are, no matter what the injury history you got, guys get hurt. But now if you lose, if you have a situation like last year and you use 14 different offensive linemen, no, you're and, and you lose the quarterback. Listen, I like to Rod Taylor. He's a nice guy who can come in and win a couple games for you. Um, but if if he's got to play 15 games and it's another it's another year of 11, 12, 13, 14 0 linemen, my expectations are changing. That's just, you know, that's the way it goes. But our choices now are talk about the Jets or don't talk about the Jets. And I, to the point of it probably being unhealthy, enjoy talking about the New York Jets. Um, so I get you, Tony. I Believe me, I don't disagree. I, I don't, as much as I think the talent is enough to be a Super Bowl contender, uh, do I believe Robert Sala can outcoach some of these top coaches in, in the league? No. I mean, that Joe Douglas's job at this point is basically go out and build a Robert Sala-proof team. Go out and build a team that, despite the fact Robert Sala is the head coach, you might be able to win something. Um, and a lot of that has to do with Nate Hackett as well. Uh, may, listen, maybe Sala does some soul-searching this offseason. Maybe Robert Sala comes back and says, hey, man, I got I got to put my foot down. We got to clean up the penalties. I got to be a disciplinarian. I got to hold guys accountable. And maybe we see some changes. And that that's something that needs to happen. Um, you can be friendly with these players. I'm not saying you got to be, you know, you got to mistreat them. But maybe a little less emphasis on buddy-buddy and more emphasis on getting results. Um, let's see. People, easy to forget Conklin's on the last year of his deal. We need Bowers. Um, I, I wouldn't disagree, uh, the franchise. But, I I mean, I wouldn't. would anyone be surprised if they extended draft Bowers and extend Conklin? I mean, having a one-two punch at tight end like that would be, I think that'd be phenomenal. I'd have no issue with that. Um, I think you need Conklin more for what he can do this year, but absolutely. If if they want to let Conklin walk, then I've, that that becomes one more reason to grab Bowers. Uh, Charles says take Odunze. Yeah, I disagree. And again, as I've said before, I will not be upset if they end up with Odunze. Just watch the guy play at Washington State. Um, not many guys catch contested balls as well as he does. I mean, that is one thing that worries me a little bit, though, is that so many, I mean, I, I would actually like to see if anyone's got a number on this. The number of catches that Dunze makes that are that are in in tight coverage, jump balls, one-on-one, -on -one, these are against, against college DBs, and he's not separating as much as I would expect to see a guy who gets as much love as he does. Um, so when, when the DBs get better, is he still going to be able to make that many plays when the DB is in his hip pocket? Um, you know, like, I, I don't like when people pretend that once you get to the NFL, every guy you go against is perfect and you're never going to be able to make a play. Like, oh, that guy can't separate. So once he gets to the NFL, he's never going to do anything. I mean, some guys still make plays. They don't make as many. Maybe he becomes a good player, not a great player. But again, what I love about Bowers is the mismatches, um, the mismatches, the versatility. The ability to make plays after the catch. Um, Adunze is reminding me of Traylon Burks. I think Burks is wider, like more broad. I think I think Adunze runs better. Burks, Burks, I did. I like Adunze more than Burks. I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and I think Burks, if I'm not mistaken, hasn't done anything yet since being drafted, and he may not do anything. Um, you know, we'll find out with that over the next couple of years. But that's listen. That's where we are right now. Brock Bowers to the Jets seems to be the single most common commonly mocked um selection but let's move on from bowers and talk about later in the draft when the jets are on the clock 
it, it was inevitable, and we're seeing it happen. There's a lot of oh, the Jets have the Jets are picking Mr. Irrele- irrelevant this year, so they've they've got to go out and they've they've got to get Brock Purdy 2.0. Listen, a couple things here. Uh, Purdy's in a great situation. There's no, there may not be a better place in the NFL to play quarterback than for the 49ers. Um, they do a really nice job. You can't expect that to be the norm. You can't say like, oh, a guy worked out as Mr. Irrelevant, so just go get the next one. Like 99 times out of 100, Mr. Irrelevant will remain Mr. Irrelevant. They will, won't do much. That doesn't mean the Jets can't take one there. I think they'll take one earlier, to be honest. My hope is Jordan Travis. Also like Michael Pratt. Michael Pratt, the only thing that worries me with him, I watch him make some of these throws. He, he throws with great touch um, and accuracy. But I haven't seen him drop back and rip it the way you want to see a guy. If you're thinking, okay, is this guy going to be playing December games in the Northeast, whether it's, you know, at home? Well, hopefully, imagine a playoff game at home. But even down the stretch, if we need a win late in the year, can he throw into the wind? I, I haven't seen him do that. I'm not saying he can't. I'm just saying in the games I've watched, I haven't seen it. Spencer Rattler, sign me up, man. I'm KD. I, I was – here's my thing with Rattler. I was – I won't say I was out on him, but last year, you know, with everything that happened with him, and it seemed like he was really immature. I had some growing up to do. Um, but I, I tweeted out, I believe it was at the end of last year. It may have been because earlier I'd said it was week one this year. I think I tweeted it week one and said Spencer Rattler looked much better at the end of last year when that carry over. And it did. You look and, – and so and the other day was the first time – like I've watched him this year. I watched him week one. He looked really good. I've watched him sparingly since then. And then the other day, I was like, let's dig in on this guy. And I watched, I think, four or five of his games in one day. And I came away all in. Like, if you can get this dude in the top 100, you get him, if you take him, even if as crazy as it sounds, if you get him with pick 72, he may not even be there then. Spencer Rattler was a guy I was like, eh. And then I watched this year's version of Spencer Rattler. The number of throws I saw that guy make with a defender burying his helmet and his face mask and his chest, like this kid knowing he's going to get pounded and he's throwing dimes deep down the field into tight coverage. I could not have been more impressed with Spencer Rattler. We had Emery Hunt on uh, for football game plan a week or two ago, and he said, I believe he said Spencer Rattler is his QB3 in this class. Um, I don't know that I would put him there. But I would have zero problem, like top five for sure. Um, and I would have zero problem with the Jets. I, he, he, I was of the belief before that Rattler might be there at 72, even having just said it. But when I say that out loud and I think of what I saw the other day, I'm just like, no, that, that dude's not going to be. He's too good to be there at 72. Um, he might not be there at, you know, 62. So Spencer Rattler, I would absolutely love that pick. Um, wouldn't be mad if the Jets traded off. Me neither. Me neither. Um, and Wild Wave is saying, why would Joe Douglas care? Listen, that's what it's about. It's about this year. I can't believe the number of times I hear people say, but what about the future? What about, what about the future O-line? Joe Douglas has no future with his team if they don't do something. I mean, could I see a scenario in which Joe Douglas returns and the Jets don't make the playoffs. If they go out and win 10 games and they look like a much better team and they're a very competitive team with a young nucleus and this year's picks play well and some of last year's picks play well, I think you keep Joe Douglas. I mean, at some point you got to, and I, I think more than a lot of people, I have a lot of respect and I've said this before. I have a lot of respect for how difficult it is to find players. We talked, Dylan and I broke this down a couple months ago. Over 50% of players bust. NFL wide. Like the league average is like 48% of players work out. And by work out, I don't mean superstars. By work out, I mean like they hang around on a roster and contribute for a full contract. 48%. And you look at Joe Douglas's picks, the his first draft was very bad, obviously. But I, you know, the, the biggest thing there was the Beckton injury. I think if Becton never gets his knee dislocated by Greg Van Roten, I think we're talking about him as a starting left tackle, a high-end starting left tackle. 
So even if they don't make the playoffs, keep Joe, says Charles. Again, that's what I mean. If they win 10 and don't make the playoffs and, and his young players are playing well, I think they say, all right, Joe, we're going to let you hire a new coach. But as long as you keep hitting on these, these players. And I pointed this out a few weeks ago. Look at what the Baltimore Ravens did under Ozzie Newsom through his first four, five, six years. They weren't doing a whole lot. No, no, didn't finish over 500. Um, won the Super Bowl, what is fourth, fifth year, fifth year, I think. So four years of, I think his best year was eight and eight, but there was like a three and 13, four and 12, something in there. Ozzie Newsom through his first four years was bad, as was Joe Douglas. And then he won the Super Bowl year five. Well, who knows what would have happened last year if not for the injuries. And as I said, some people are okay with blaming GMs for injuries. I'm not one of them. I don't think it's Joe Douglas's fault that ABT tore a, a tricep and a, an Achilles and Rogers Achilles went and Beckton's knee. I don't think those things are the GM's fault. Blame them if you want, but I'm not doing that. I'm looking at the, the big picture, the 53-man roster, how much talent do we have. This, talent, this team has a lot of talent. Um, if you look at it objectively and, and just forget the fact that you're you're angry at the GM because a bunch of guys got hurt. So real quick here. So real quick, some of the some of the day three type quarterbacks, as I said, people are going to be talking about who's the next Brock Purdy, who's the next Brock Purdy. Um, I'm not talking about Brock Purdy's. I'm, I mean, just day three guys, potential. And that's actually, yeah, I I've, I've said Mr. Irrelevant. That would be, of course, be the Jets' last pick. But what I, what I meant to start out by saying was day three guys, um, guys you might get in the sixth round, in the seventh round. Maybe it is Mr. Irrelevant. But here are a few names to keep an eye on come draft time. Um, Carter Bradley, South Alabama, Dylan Terman and I have talked about him a fair bit after watching him in Mobile. He was much better than I expected. He was quick, decisive. Ball came out in a hurry. He was accurate. Um, and he had himself a decent career at South Alabama. So he he's a possibility. Sam Hartman, of course, the quarterback from Notre Dame. He he had a rough time in Mobile. I came away not not impressed. I was far more impressed with him with what I saw on game days throughout the season than I was in Mobile. Um, but Devin Leary, um, he's a guy I watched a fair bit of at NC State. He then transferred to Kentucky. I'm actually watching it right now. I'm watching some of him right now. I think, look, he's got the arm. I think I, I'm always intrigued by these guys who come in with a lot of hype, who look, you know, good to great at one program and then transfer and don't look as impressive. And it's like, was transferring a mistake? Did you go to a system where you didn't fit the way you thought you would? Did you have a harder time adjusting to new personnel than you thought you would? Like there's so many factors that can contribute to a guy not playing as well as he had in the past or the way you expected him to. Um, so Devin Leary, I think, you know, you look, there are some mocks that have him as a UDFA. I'm sure there must be some that have him getting drafted. He's not, he's not a, a lock to go undrafted, at least in my mind. Jason Bean, I've mentioned him before as more of a developmental, a backup type who may one day be a starter, but because of his age, he's 26 years old. Um, much older guy for a rookie. When I'm looking at him, I'm thinking UDFA. I'm thinking round seven. And I'm thinking maybe his ceiling is is quality backup to, you know, um, spot starter, that type of thing. Uh, throws the ball well on the run, has a big arm, smooth on the move. I think he's a guy who could get drafted. And if he doesn't, I think he could, you know, he's got enough tools to stick. Keaton Slovis from BYU. Haven't watched him in a little while. Really liked him last year. I watched him a bit earlier this year. I think he's somebody who is definitely in play. And I see KD just mentioned the the QB from BYU is gaining a lot of steam. That's that's him, Keaton Slovis. And I want to say, could be crazy. I think he was with Pitt. I think that's when I first watched him. Um when he was a Pitt Panther. Um, so I don't know about I don't know about I mean, no one knows at this point, obviously, where he's gonna go. But Keaton Slovis is a guy who I thought was more impressive. Or I shouldn't say more impressive, but a guy who was also impressive. Um, I could be an idiot here dropping the ball, but I'm 99% sure I watched him play for Pitt. Brandon Armstrong, NC State. He's another guy. Played for Virginia, Virginia Tech, uh, a couple seasons ago and looked really good. And then they switched offensive coordinators. And then last year, things kind of fell apart for him. And he looked nothing like the guy he was before. And then he transferred. 
and didn't look nearly as good. So you look at him, you're like, which one was the real guy? Was it two years ago when he was in a system where maybe he was more comfortable um, and he played at a much higher level than he has since leaving? Does that make him sort of a, 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 a low risk, high reward type guy? That's possible. The last guy I wanted to mention, make sure that I'm sorry, two more guys. Jack Plummer from Louisville throws a really nice deep ball. Watch him against FSU. I think it, I believe it was FSU. He threw about a million touchdowns. Um, hitting guys in stride deep down the field. Not a not a you know, doesn't have a rocket for an arm, but he can he he can make he can make enough of the throws. And and maybe I need to watch more of him. I don't know if that's a, a fair assessment. I've only watched two games and he does like I said, he's got deep accuracy. Uh, puts a lot of air under the ball, though. Not not a rifle arm like a like a a, a Rogers type thing, where he you know throws it where the ball's eight nine feet off the ground, you know, all the way down the field. So the, and the last one, the last guy I wanted to mention real quick. Let's scroll up and find him. John Rice Plumley from UCF. I think I actually tweeted about him a couple months ago as well. Very athletic guy, who productive guy at during his time at UCF, the few games I watched him, he protected the football, he made good decisions, and he's a guy, his pro day was crazy. I, I don't have the numbers in front of you. Like, his athletic number, like, I knew he could run, but his athletic numbers were were through the roof. They may have been, I should look, I'm looking up later on math on RAS, his relative athletic score. He may have been number one in this class um, all around, if, if I'm not mistaken. Definitely near the top. Um, ran a good 40. I think he had a crazy vert, good broad. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going off memory. I, I can't remember exactly what he did. I just remember seeing the numbers roll in and I was like, wow, that's, that's a guy I talked about a couple months ago or a couple weeks ago on Twitter. And he, uh, again, knew he was athletic, but he kind of blew it out of the water. So those are some of the day three guys or UDFA types who the jets could consider, even if they draft a the guy, which again, I fully expect them to, you know, maybe you bring one of these guys in as a developmental practice squad type guy. Um, Austin Reed from Western Kentucky. Dylan, how are we doing, man? I I have it because I've there's so little film on him. Um, uh, he's a guy. As a matter of fact, looking at Malachi Corley a couple months ago, I was trying to find as much film as I could, um, and there just wasn't as much. Whether it was through um, caddies or whatever, there wasn't enough there. So I, I haven't seen enough of him to say. Now, of course, we've got 15 days till the draft. I have my list, my homework. I've got about 30 guys who I think are going to be drafted that I haven't watched enough of to pull highlights and kind of draw an opinion on. And he is one of them, Austin Reed. So I'll be getting, uh, hopefully, it's been, a, you know, of course, these the sites that we used for, for the All-22s and all that, they will add games as the season goes on, as the draft process gets closer. I'm hoping they add something on Austin Reed. And there's a few other guys uh, that there's nothing out there on. I'm hoping, you know, we, we see some games pop up. And we're able to do a more accurate evaluation of, of all these players. So that'll do it for this one. But tomorrow night, like I said, be sure to tune in. Myself, Dylan Terriman, Chris Schubert. We're going to do my guy at each position. Um, you can probably hear some of the names I mentioned tonight, um, at least on my list. And we'll do that tomorrow night with a little more draft talk. And at that point, I believe the draft is two weeks tomorrow. I think we're 15 days out, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, cause it's, it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? So two weeks tomorrow, NFL draft, uh, my info says Spencer Rattler could see him on the Jets. Yep. Touched on him a little while ago. Um, my info, I think that he's a guy, as I said, Dylan's been banging the drum for Spencer Rattler all year. I've been kind of like, yeah, I'll watch him later. Um, you know, didn't love the attitude, but then I kind of took a step back and said, look, you know, he, he's got some, some video of him out there being, kind of a not so great guy but you know what he was 15 or 16 so I kind of said you know give the kid a break watch him play some football I saw him at the senior bowl saw him in mobile saw him speaking to the press um had a chance to watch him up close and interact and I get you know these guys are coached up by agents and stuff like that I understand all that but uh but he handled himself well and I, I I'm standing there you know just a couple feet from him watching him talk and I'm thinking maybe the kid's grown up you know let's let me let me stop holding the you know, a quote from six years ago against him and let's watch him play football. And I did that a couple weeks ago. I watched four or five games and I messaged Dylan right away. I was like, Hey man, I'm all into like, I've, I've now 
taken the time to watch him extensively and not just the one or two games I'd seen him play earlier in the year. So, yes, Spencer Rattler on the Jets would absolutely love it. Jordan Travis would absolutely love it. Michael Pratt would like it, but would have some worries about the arm strength in playoff time football. That'll wrap this one up for us. Check us out tomorrow night, Jet Nation Live. Me, Dylan, Chris, talking draft, talking our guys. Have a good one, Jets fans.